I'd like to introduce Lauren Pizer Mains from the office of California State Senator Ben Allen's office, District 26. The VGM stands in District 26, which used to be represented by State Senator Ted Liu, now U.S. Congress member. With State Assembly member Betsy Butler, they introduced Assembly Concurrent Resolution 46, which requested that the State Department of Transportation issue to the VGM an encroachment permit. ACR 46 passed in April 2001, so the VGM and District 26 go way back. Thank you, Lauren, for coming. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, our keynote speaker, who gets to talk for more than two minutes. <laughs> Warren Furitani has been a community activist his entire life, from grassroots organizing to elected political office. Warren started the annual pilgrimage to Manzanar in 1969 and co-founded the Manzanar Committee in 1970 with Sue Kunitomo Embry to educate the general public about the World War II imprisonment of Japanese Americans in American concentration camps without due process and in violation of the constitutional rights. Thank you for coming, Warren. Thank you. <clears throat> I always like to take just a moment to look at who's looking at me. And I got to tell you, I'm not surprised one bit that a monument like this is being placed on this corner in the community of Venice. I know that Supervisor Yaroslavsky mentioned how much of a pain in the ass political activists can be, but it's that activism that makes things happen. And that's why this monument is so important. This year is the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. And as all of us have probably gone to schools and had government classes and we've learned about checks and balances and we've learned about the legislative process or have been bored by the legislative process, we've gotten a re-education about executive orders with this current presidential administration. Executive orders are exactly that. The executive of our country can order something, and unless that order is challenged, they go through. So 75 years ago, an executive order, and it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, because President Roosevelt was a Democrat, the current president is a Republican, but if there is no response for the community at large, then whatever may be motivating, whatever may be the impetus for doing what they're doing, happens. So as several speakers have already mentioned, things have changed. Back in 1942, when executive order was passed, no one stood up to say anything. A few troublemakers, like those of you in Venice, Quakers and others, had their voices raised, but pretty quickly dissipated in the chorus of other voices they were being raised about Japanese at that time. Just like the stories you hear and choruses you hear relative to Muslims today. But I'm telling you whether it was military necessity, which was the phrase used back in World War II, relative to the rationale for putting Japanese and Japanese American citizens in camp, today is national security, the term that phrase that is used to put those people of a certain religious background, not only in camps, but can't immigrate here, can't come here, unless people stand up and challenge an executive order. And things have changed. Courts from Hawaii to the state of Washington, Colorado, have challenged the executive order relative to eliminating immigration or limiting immigration from countries that are dominantly Muslim. People have stood on street corners with signs. Millions of women have marched in Washington. People have participated in pushing back and standing up, voices heard, 
clearly ringing forward that we are a democratic nation, a nation of laws based upon the Constitution that guarantees that what happened to Japanese Americans should not ever happen again. So why a monument? I really commend the Venice Japanese American Monument Memorial Monument Committee for this effort. I mean, just placing this stone, I can't even imagine, but I've loved to have been here just logistically to see how they put this thing here. I hope there's a videotape of our artist who made this important statement that will live forever but I'm going to tell you and predict something right now. In a few days, weeks, months, maybe it'll take years, and I know the Ventus community will be very vigilant, but this marker will be defaced. It will be defaced some way, somehow. And when it gets defaced, I'm telling this community, do not fix it. Don't wipe it off. Don't recast the words. Let that defacement be a testament to the kind of attitudes that still exist in this country that can elect a president like the one we have now and that we need to remember that so we know that our work is not done. So I remember as a young boy, usually in hushed tones when relatives would come over or friends would visit at the family house, people would talk about camp, camp. My only reference to camp was going to the YMCA summer camp. Did they make lanyards there and did they go out on canoes? What was this camp that they talked about in hushed tones? I remember also in the community that when those of us at that time being very young decided to raise this issue about camps, what were these camps that Japanese Americans were put in? Can you imagine? Can you imagine with just a matter of days, and my father comes from the Terminal Island community, so for them it was a matter of hours to liquidate everything they possibly could and with only what they could carry under their arms, come to a street corner to board a truck or a train or a bus to go to places unknown, unheard of, with a fate that was insecure and unknown. Can you imagine going through that? So that's why this corner and the location of this monument is so critical to give you an idea. And that's why we go to the Manson Art Pilgrimage, which is going to be this Saturday, to just give people a sense of what it was like. So in 1969, a couple of us decided we needed to march somewhere. The farm workers had marched to Sacramento. There had been a poor people's march in Washington, D.C. We as Asian Americans need to march somewhere. And this issue of camp came up again. But in those days, people called them internment camps. They called them relocation camps. And there's one thing about politics there's one thing about politics related to not sympathy, but empathy, is that you put yourself in that other person's shoes. And so the perspective is not predicated on a political spin or a public relations moment using a term that may be more palatable to the public. The determination of the term used is predicated on those on the inside looking out, not on the outside looking in. So on this monument, just like we fought back in the early 70s to get the same phrase on the bronze monument at Manzanar that exists there today with shotgun marks on it, hatchet marks on it, where people have tried to deface it, is the term concentration camp. Concentration camp. So people said, well, wait a minute, you're going to confuse it with what happened in the Holocaust. But if you go to the Jewish American community and you ask them what they call their camps, they didn't call them concentration camps. They called them death camps from the inside looking out. So it's a matter of perspective, point of view. And that's what this monument is so important. 
That's why it's a touchstone not only to history, but it's a live history that exists still today and it's applicable more than ever, where the voices get raised anytime there's a problem, anytime there's an issue. Yes, someone was shot in the back at Manzanar, but other people have been shot in the back in the streets of urban areas throughout the United States, and they just happen to be African Americans. And I don't believe in the term Black Lives Matter. I believe Black Lives haven't mattered enough. That's why people can shoot them in the back. So as we look at this, this is not a trip down memory lane. This is not something that we're going to look at just as a history lesson to be learned about what happened when. This value, it's important, it's relevant, is based upon the reality that what brought about the hysteria, what brought about the political expediency, what brought about the attitudes that allowed people to be put in camp, although American citizens for the most part, is an attitude that still exists today where just because of your religion, your color of skin, your gender, your sexual orientation, people make assumptions and if doggone it, something goes wrong, then you're the one to blame. So that's why this is so important today. In this corner that has a lot of traffic, in this community that is known for its progressive politics and its outlook on the world is so important because it stands as a touchstone. Not a two-dimensional image on a screen of a computer, but we want our kids to come by here not to look at pictures, but literally to touch it. So I'm with a friend the first time we go to Manzanar. And we came and we knew it was somewhere between Lone Pine and Independence, and there was an old green building still there. Still there. Well, we saw a sign that said Manzanar Road, and when we hit Manzanar Road, we turned right on Highway 395 and we went east. We didn't know where we were going. And when we went there, we saw all of this asphalt and dirt roads and the imagination predicated on our ignorance put in place the barracks that we had seen in pictures. And then this pickup truck in the distance came rumbling toward us. And as we see this pickup truck, we notice in the back window, there's gun racks with shotguns. And these guys pull up with cowboy hats on and they say, what are you boys doing out here? And we were pretty filled with piss and vinegar back in those days. I'm a 60s radical, just like a lot of you folks. And we said, we're not boys, we're men, and we're here to find the camps that racists like you put our community in. And they started laughing. They started laughing because they then told us if you guys are looking for the camp the Japanese were put in, it's on the west side of 395. <laughs> so we had to get in our car and drive across 395 to find where the real camp was. And as we drove down this dirt road, undulating up and down in gulfs and not valleys, but a badlands kind of attitude, where it looks like it's flat, but it's really not. And as you went out to these dips, you couldn't see over the horizon. But we kept going, and then in the distance, with the background of Mount Whitney and the Sierra Nevada Mountains, in an upper desert of the Owens Valley, stood this monument. A white beacon that shined its light of freedom for a couple of us ignorant people that were trying to figure out what this camp experience was all about came upon. But we also came upon another reality. That reality was the Reverend Wakahiro and Reverend Maeda, Tule, a Buddhist minister and a Christian priest, were coming back every year since the camp closed for Hakamaiti to come back and pay their respects. Because even though the government said that they exhumed all the bodies out of the graveyard, in fact, they knew that bodies still exist. So that's where this monument is. Whether it's here on the corner of Lincoln and Venice Boulevards, or it's on the west side, and let me repeat that, the west side of 395 in the Owens Valley. They stand as beacons for freedom, for liberty, and for justice. 
So I congratulate the Venice Japanese American Memorial Monument Committee for a job well done. And to all of you, thank you very much for coming out today. And the lessons are just starting to be taught. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Warren.